We talked about the care planning process and the variety of different assessments, goals, plans, and interventions that we can have for a number of different types of patients. But let's focus on one specific case study with a specific symptom, loneliness. We talked about the care planning process and the importance of following the the uh, the the step-by-step -step process for a PI or assessment, plan, intervention, and evaluation. So we'll take a look at this focusing on one particular symptom. So when we do an assessment and we discover that the symptoms, uh, we discover symptoms based on our conversations with our patients. So if I ask a patient about their hobbies and social activities, their favorite memories, their relationship with their family, those answers might reveal that the patient feels lonely. They may not say the, those words specifically, I feel lonely, but you can ask and validate to see if that is the case, that you get the idea or the impression that they feel, ang that they feel lonely. We can do that with a variety of different emotions as well. If a patient has a very gruff exterior, is um, you know, maybe using curse words and is very assertive or, or combative, we say, you sound angry. Is that a fair assessment? Is that a fair statement? And they may answer, no, I'm not angry. <laughs> or they may say, yes, of course I'm angry because, and it actually helps you to hone in and fine tune specifically what your uh, patient is experiencing and that your perceptions are right and, and correct. And those are things that you can very specifically chart when you're char charting about the assessment of your patient and the course of the visit, what happened during the visit. So with the specific idea of the patient being lonely, that we may take a look at saying that um, what are the experiences that they're experience that they have, um, and that studies have, are showing and, and have um, revealed that loneliness is very common in our elders. There are causes and contributing factors that lead to a feeling of loneliness, which include physical isolation, chronic illness or disabilities, the death of a significant person in the patient's life, moving to a new location, leaving family and friends behind. We find that in uh, hospice and long-term care in particular, because sometimes the patient's family, the, maybe the, one of the maybe one of the daughters is going to care for um, the elder, and they they've lived in New York, but you know they are moving down to uh, Florida to uh, uh, be cared for in a long-term care facility, uh, and they may not have the types of connections and community support that they would have had in their uh, original community. So we want to take a look at those types of things as well as the support or lack of support from their religious, cultural, or social communities. Keeping these variables in mind can help direct the conversation with the family. So that answers might reveal the patient's loneliness, and even if their reflections bring happiness or a feeling of nostalgia, it may be that they are then feeling wistful and longing for a different kind of connection and wishing that they had the same connections they had in the past. So when we take a look then at assessments and what other symptoms might you observe or maybe you've heard of. So if you have a chance to definitely talk with the other members of your team, find out how they feel the patient has been. Just a, uh, actually a very good hint is to talk with the certified nursing assistants or the patient tech. The folks that have been taking care of the patient most intimately and most regularly will often have really wonderful insights about how the patient is coping with their condition and what's happening with them. And they can let you know that they've had a lack of appetite. They ring their call bell frequently for minor requests, different minor requests. Perhaps they cry frequently. They're very sad. They're not sleeping well. They don't have close friends to talk with. They don't have friends to share secrets with and their most intimate thoughts. They maybe have negative self-talk and negative self-worth. They don't show much compassion for themselves and they don't have an opportunity to feel and express compassion for others. They may also have substance abuse and that's an important, an important aspect to consider as well. 
that patients say in a uh, assisted living facility or a hospital might you know the the staff might not and maybe even kind of assume that the patient wouldn't have that because after all they're a senior you know would you really have um, you know both well, of course they don't have substance abuse but yeah they might uh, whether it's drug use or um, abusing prescription uh, medications or drinking all of those kinds of things can really be um, exacerbating their feeling of loneliness. So it's really important to report those symptoms at, to the, your team, to the physician, the pa patient's primary nurse or their physician, as well as taking them into consideration for the type of care plan that you want to develop and how the visits might go uh, in order to help the patient with this particular problem. So let's take a look more at how to fit this information into the plan of care. So identifying the symptom of loneliness and then working with the patient to come up with a goal and then eventually some possible interventions. So let's say that you have established with the patient that they feel lonely. So what are the possible goals that the patient might have? Reducing a sense of loneliness or isolation very general, but certainly a very uh, very good um, possible goal for them, to maximize their sense of connection with others, to integrate their new role into their identity, perhaps a little bit more complex, but yet a very important one, especially if, for instance, the matriarch of the family has been used to caring for everyone. She's the one who has changed every diaper, who has cooked every meal, has taken care of everyone. Now she's in a position where she can't do those things and feels that she's been, become a burden and maybe has even pushed away her family because she can't provide the care for them. She feels useless and feels that they should go elsewhere for their care needs. But she can learn more about being an emotional support to the family and caring in a different way. But and also establishing quality relationships with others. In a long-term care facility, this might be taking a look at the table mates. You know, do they have, do they go to the dining room to eat? Or is there anyone there that they can connect with? It wouldn't have to be long uh, afternoons together. It could simply be an hour of playing cards or something that uh, can connect them. Perhaps a book club or a way to uh, look at a sing-along of the old standards, something that they can connect with and understand and have and some enjoyment with, even if it's for a fairly short amount of time, it is a quality interaction. Um, also establishing connections through community organizations, and there may be a, a number of them that are available that haven't been utilized at this juncture that you can consider. So what are then the possible interventions? So exploring the frequency and quality of social contacts to listen using empathy, re restatement, validation, clarification, and even silence so that they feel that they can have some quality time talking and uh, being listened to and being heard. Identifying appro appropriate scripture readings, prayer, and other practices from the patient's faith tradition. Again, these would be things that are meaningful for the patient, that make sense for them, and are in alignment with their personal faith journey. So even though there might be, we might assume that they would, from the, the, whatever the, ch the church that they're most in alignment with, or where they've, what they've marked on their admission um, information, and you look at their case sheet and you see that they're a Southern Baptist, and so you think, oh yeah, I know exactly which hymns and which scripture readings. And yet when you do uh, interact with the patient and discover that really they love nature, that nature makes them feel very connected to the, high, the higher power, to their spirituality, to God. By looking at ways that you can incorporate that can also help. Perhaps bringing in pictures of birds or beautiful pictures of nature, um, different things that can uh, connect with them that me are meaningful for them. Encouraging a volunteer visit. There are a number of different volunteer organizations, and perhaps your facility has a volunteer setting as well, that you'd be able to move forward and have a volunteer come to visit. Taking a look at what the best things for that volunteer 
would be to do. We talked a little earlier about if a patient has respiratory distress and they really don't have the energy to talk a lot, you might have that person then read a book to them. Um, you know, taking a look at uh, books that they loved in their past, um, things that perhaps you and I would, maybe a, a mo you know, modern uh, young people would be curious, why on earth would you want to read Pilgrim's Progress, for instance? And yet, I know that my grandmother loved that book. So being able for a volunteer to be able to read that to her would have been a wonderful thing. So all of those different kinds of activities need to be identified and individualized for that specific patient. So it's never a cookie cutter. We always want to make sure we're looking at the things that are meaningful for the patient. The volunteer might do some adult coloring books with the patient. Or if you have access to a, an art therapist who can go in and, and enhance then that understanding of the interventions that can help with loneliness and can help with quality connections with others. Referrals to community agencies can be very appropriate, especially if you're in a hospice, hospital situation um, setting where you can then um, encourage other community organizations. Perhaps the patient would be a very good candidate for an adult daycare setting. The family may not have even realized that such a thing exists, and yet adult daycare centers can be very helpful and valuable for patients. They may resist at first, oh, I don't know those people, I'm really not sure about that, and yet many times when they give it a try, they discover that they really do enjoy the activities and the connections that they can make with people that they are just meeting. Plus, it's a you know, it's a, a limited time kind of thing. You go in, you spend just a, a short, maybe a short period of time or a few hours, in some cases the full day, but then you go home for dinner and maybe talk about, complain about <laughs> what happened that day um, to find out um, different aspects of learning about other people, uh, hearing their stories, and being able to share your stories are very great, a really great thing to do. Also, really identify some of the stressors that may have caused the feeling of loneliness. Um, again, I think I had related earlier about a story of a patient who I was having trouble as a, as a hospice nurse to pay attention to the patient's pain, to get that pain under control. And the mentor, the chaplain mentor, helped me understand that if the patient has other issues, it may be very difficult to get their pain under control. And we did discover that working together with the social worker, the chaplain, and myself, we discovered that the patient needed additional help reconciling and connecting with his brother. So he missed his brother. He felt lonely for him. So those are kinds of things that can really help. Um, encouraging the, the patient to write a letter to, their bro the, to the brother. Um, maybe that brother will never reconcile with them um, while they're still alive, they may really have just a few weeks or days to live, but they are able to either dictate a letter, perhaps a volunteer can help with that, or you can help with that, or taking a look at um, getting the brother on the phone. Uh, today we have the uh, wonderful ability to do FaceTiming on the phone or using tablets so that you can see the person. Um, that's another really wonderful way to connect. There also might be ways for the kids in the family to connect with the elder. Um, those types of things can really um, help um, encourage that family connection and look at quality interactions with them. Definitely encourage exercise, drinking enough water, and eat, eating healthy foods. While um, we, we don't generally want to get too um, deep into self-care kinds of things, um, sometimes encouraging self-care activities can feel a little bit like we're blaming the patient for what's happening. And yet, if they're lonely, they may very well not be sleeping well, which then means that maybe they skip breakfast or they, uh, they're not hungry, so they only have you know, a little bowl of soup for, for lunch or whatever the case might be. Um, they're not drinking enough water, and it becomes a vicious cycle. So um, it's important just to bring that as one of the possibilities. Hey, have you, you know, and it's nice too, as a chaplain, you might take a walk with them. Would you like to walk down to, um, in the hospital, hey, would you like to walk down to the, the waiting room at the end of the, of the hallway of your, of your floor? Or a, a facility, uh, let's walk out to the porch. It's, it's a beautiful sunny day. Um, and 
comment on the things that you see when you're out and about. You might be looking out and saying, oh, look at the sun shining. Um, do you see the birds in the tree? Pointing out different things that the patient can connect with. Because in loneliness, sometimes we become so self-identified, we go into ourself that we forget that there are many wonderful things to um, appreciate in the world. So general, there are many general uh, interventions. Now at the, uh, the next, in our concluding um, uh, video, um, I'll have some links available for you to have to download the text of this pre the whole presentation, as well as uh, the ability to download a certificate if that would be helpful, and also links to these general inter interventions so that you'll be able to research and learn more about them if you need to. But some of them I think are very helpful for any type of, uh, most actually most of the symptoms that we might uh, uncover and, and write as a goal for our, uh, a, you know, possible symptom with a goal uh, for our plan of care for a patient. And guided imagery is one that I think is very helpful for patients. Um, again, you want to ask the pa for any of these, you want to ask for permission, you want to ask for basically consent. Um, the patient may have different ideas or um, about what that what they, these things mean, um, and you might want to be able to explain them to the patient and be able to help them understand that uh, these are things that are possible to help them, and they might give them a try. And uh, certainly, if they like them, then to be able to continue them and, and to practice them. So, guided imagery is one that can be very helpful, um, encouraging the patient to close their eyes and lead them to a safe space, a beautiful garden um, where they can be at peace. One of the things I love to add for the guided imageries with patients who uh, enjoy that is to talk about, um, you know, walking into a beautiful garden, sitting on a bench, and then having maybe someone who's gone before, uh, someone who's passed and has gone before them, maybe joins them that they can ask questions of. Perhaps Jesus joins them, another spiritual leader, um, if they, whatever their faith tradition is, uh, that the leader of that faith or the, uh, the, the sacred person that they are connect with and feel most comfortable with. Perhaps they simply sit in silence together or perhaps they have an opportunity to ask a question that may be on their mind and a way to be silent and quiet and listen for the answer. A pastoral presence is certainly very important. To be mindful of the patient is very uh, a very powerful thing. When we're with our patients and suspending judgment, fully listening, they feel really supported, loved, and heard. And that's a wonderful gift. I'm sure that you've had situations, your experiences yourself of maybe you sat down for lunch with a close friend and you had things on your mind and you were sharing with your friend and but you knew that they were really listening and or maybe it was just a casual conversation but they were really listening. They weren't trying to think of something to say um, to respond, something clever in return. They were really listening to what you had to say and when they were speaking you really listened to them as well. Those are the kind of memories I think we keep with us for, for ever. <laughs> you know, it's a memory that we cherish for our life. And what a wonderful thing when we can give that gift to more people to create wonderful memories for our friends and family and for our patients. Relaxation is important as well, whether it's for loneliness or really any other stressor in our lives to learn progressive relaxation. It's something really good to practice. It helps anxious uh, patients become more calm. And we can start with the face and work through our body pr uh, promoting relaxation. You know, we, I like to start with uh, the face because it's a funny kind of thing that we can do to say, okay, scrunch your face up really tight. Yeah, <laughs> make a funny face. But when you let go, then you realize how tight you had kept your face. Amazing. You think, okay, my shoulder, my scalp, my shoulders, my neck, all those things might be really tight and with an anxiousness or, or tension. When I can take a breath and relax, wow, it feels much better right away. So those are things that you can um, work, work with with your patient as well as yourself. 
Um, coping skills, um, we've all been through hard times. You probably have patients who had have overcome amazing hurdles in their life, really um, striking um, events, but they may not realize that how much uh, they've been able to cope, how strong they've been, helping them remember that and learn to use those coping skills in any situation are very helpful. And prayer, of course. Discovering what the meaning of prayer is for the patient. And again, really looking at the forms that they use and not assuming that we know. Not dictating what our theology is or our doctrines, as heartfelt as they can be, are not part of what this patient journey is about. Looking for the ways that they interact, what they consider prayer. So when you take a look at the gamut of faith traditions, whether the patient is Buddhist and have, uses what's called a gatha or a simple mantra or, or phrase that they use repetitively, breathing in, I know that I'm breathing in, breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out, breathing in peace, breathing out calm. In a quiet, reverential way, that becomes a prayer for that patient. Someone who is an atheist or agnostic or humanist may have a way to connect with song or poetry, different types of music. Perhaps they are in awe of the universe itself and can look at beautiful photographs and videos of the stars, the wonderful um, universe of, of light and sound and um, life around us becomes very meaningful and becomes a sacred space for that patient. So whatever terminology that they use, we're there to meet them in that place. And I do think that by suspending our determination to use our own vocabulary, we open ourselves up to learning a great deal from different patients by not expecting to use a specific term or word, whether it's prayer or faith or God or any of the other types of terms that are part of our religious heritage and religious traditions, and learning that what the patient is calling refreshing, nurturing, many of those other terms can actually help us recognize the sacred and the spiritual within that framework. We benefit as well as the patient benefiting from them knowing that we are a safe person to be able to express their beliefs and their innermost feelings and thoughts and making that a quality connection and quality interaction that can really help to alleviate that feeling of loneliness they may be experiencing. So evaluation of, the, of those interventions. So as we've spent time with the patient, perhaps reaching out to the family, um, asking them to write a letter to their family that may or may not ever be sent, but it's something that can help connect them so that the patient, um, perhaps then the patient reaches out on their own volition to their family members for connection. They seem more relaxed after validating their feelings. They accepted a referral to an appropriate agency or community resource. They accepted a clergy referral they agreed to a volunteer visit once a week. So those types of things help to show that in we did an assessment, understood that the patient was feeling loneliness as a symptom, created a goal for the patient within, with them of wanting to have more connection for their family, for instance. The interventions became using guided imagery, prayer, writing letters to the family, reaching out, taking the risk or the, to being, having courage and being brave to risk and reaching out, learning to adapt and change their idea of their role within the family life. And then finally to come back around to evaluate that the patient did reach out to their family, that they feel more relaxed and more accepting. So hopefully you can take a look and see from the, this specific example of a way to look from start to finish 
how we're looking at a plan of care. I think it becomes less kind of clinical and less daunting to look at it in this way, to say, okay, the many of the things that we do on a daily basis seem like things that you can't really describe or can't really express in these terms. So the terms, oh, this just feels so clinical and uh, removed from uh, what we really do and that the meaningfulness, the, the heartfelt nature of the work that we do. But I think hopefully you can see where those two things don't have to be at odds with each other. In fact, that they can um, integrate with each other very nicely and very well in a way that all of the members of the team can understand and relate to. And you'll be able to show that, that the value that you're adding to the patient's life, be able to help other members of the team to encourage and reinforce the activity, the, the work that you're doing to help the patient to give them that extra, the extra few minutes of connection that they need, the, uh, the ways that they can reach out to, to create and, um, and express their compassion for the patient. So let's look at the conclusion and some additional tips.